بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad in our last episode uh, we were discussing the Mi'raj of the Prophet we were looking at some of the narrations that that delve into the details of that experience and continuing the narration of the Mi'raj it's a very lengthy uh, narration but we'll try to go over uh, some of the most important highlights of the prophetic uh, accession, uh, ascension again the the tradition that i'm drawing from is uh, is from volume 18 of Bihar al-Anwar uh, pages 330 and uh, onward. So the hadith continues where the Prophet says, قال, again, he's he's accompanied uh, by Jibra'il and they're ascending through the various uh, skies. And the Prophet says, قال, ثم مضيت, فإذا, So after the Prophet you know meets the, the angel of death, he says, قال ثم مضيت فإذا أنا بقوم بين أيديهم موائد من لحم طيب ولحم خبيث يأكلون اللحم الخبيث ويدعون الطيب The Prophet says we continued on our journey, on our ascension until we came across a group of people who had dishes of good food in front of them and dishes of spoiled food. And the Prophet says, I saw that these people were consuming the spoiled rotten food and they were leaving the good fresh food. So the Prophet of course puzzled by this he turns to Jibra'il for an explanation. فَقُلْتُ مَنْ هَؤُلَاءَ يَا جِبْرَائِيل. The Prophet ﷺ, he asks the angel Gabriel, Who are these people? Why are they behaving like this? The Prophet uh, Jibra'il responds saying, هَؤُلَاءِ الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ الْحَرَامِ وَيَدَعُونَ الْحَلَالِ وَهُمْ مِنْ أُمَّتِكَ يَا مُحَمَّدِ These people are the ones who used to abandon what was lawful and good and they would consume and they were busy chasing after what was unlawful. And these are people of your ummah who used to consume that which is forbidden. What you notice in the hadith of the Mi'raj is that the Prophet ﷺ, he is essentially being shown the inner reality of certain sins. Now mind you, it seems that these are uh, barzakhi visions where the Prophet is essentially being shown the reality what is actually happening to the soul? What is the, the true nature of certain acts of disobedience? And there's, there are a long list of what the Prophet sees, but I'll just uh, go over a few of them. So here, the, the act of pursuing and consuming what God has forbidden and leaving what is permitted and what is lawful manifests in that world, in that realm, it manifests itself in this way, where you have people consuming what is rotten, what is spoiled, and abandoning what is fresh and what is lawful. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وآله. The Prophet continues to narrate, saying, ثُمَّ رَأَيْتُ مَلَكًا مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ أَمْرَهُ عَجَبًا the Prophet says, Then I saw an angel among the angels created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah created this angel in a way that was truly mesmerizing. 
it was astonishing. The sight of this angel was, uh, was amazing. It was stunning. What was amazing about the condition of this angel? The Prophet says, نِصْفُ جَسَدِهِ النَّارِ وَالنِصْفُ الْآخَرْ ثَلْج The Prophet says that I saw an angel as we were ascending uh, through the, the heavens. I saw an angel whose whom half of its body was fire and the other half was ice. So imagine this creature, this angel that the Prophet sees is made of half fire and half ice. Again, these are the, the words that the Prophet is using to convey uh, that experience, which we can say is, is an indescribable experience. But, you know, we're limited with language, and the Prophet is also limited with uh, language. He's trying to communicate what is most similar to what we can understand. So he says that I see this angel that is half fire and half ice. And then he says, what is, what is incredible is that فَلَنْ نَارُ تُذِيبُ الثَّلْجِ وَلَا الثَّلْجُ يُطْفِئُ النَّارُ The Prophet says, neither does the fire cause the ice to melt, nor does the ice extinguish the fire. وَهُوَ يُنَادِي بِصَوْتٍ رَفِيعٍ This angel, which is composed of half fire and half ice, it calls, it, it makes a prayer, it calls out, saying, سُبْحَانَ الَّذِي كَفَّ حَرَّ هَذِهِ النَّارِ فَلَا تُذِيبُ الثَّلْجِ Glory be to the one who prevents the fire, this fire, from melting the ice and prevents the ice from extinguishing the fire. And then the angel says, Allahumma ya mu'allifa bayna thalji wa nar. Oh, the one who has allowed, who has created me in such a way where fire and ice come together, but neither affects the other. O Allah, in the same way that you brought these two elements together in me, bring together the hearts of the believers. Bring together and create affinity between the hearts of the believers. So you see that this angel, and we know that malaika, many of them, they make dua, but this specific angel that the Prophet meets, uh, makes this specific dua, asking Allah to reconcile uh, between the hearts of His believing servants. So the Prophet, after seeing this fascinating angel, this unique angel, he says to Jibra'il, Who is this, O Jibra'il? فَقَالَ هَذَا مَلَكٌ وَكَلَهُ اللَّهُ بِأَكْنَافِ السَّمَاءِ وَأَطْرَافِ الْأَرَضِينَ Jibra'il says that Allah has appointed this angel as the angel who is at the entrance, is at the, the is near, is at the lower heaven and near the earth, at the edge of where the heavens and the earth meet. وَهُوَ أَنصَحُ مَلَائِكَةِ اللَّهِ لِأَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَدْعُوا لَهُمْ بِمَا تَسْمَعْ مُنْذُ خُلِقٍ Jibra'il says that this angel is the most concerned with the affairs of the earth. And it prays for the believers in such a way since the moment it was created. So you see, brothers and sisters, when you read traditions like this, you know, we often feel overwhelmed. We feel that the forces of evil are constantly overwhelming the forces of good. But from this narration and from other traditions, what we understand is that in 
in the, in the unseen world, there is an entire network of angels that are, that are praying and supplicating for the salvation of believers. So it's important that we don't become discouraged or disenchanted by what we experience in this earthly world. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has indeed tipped the scales in our favor. There is so much going on in Alamul Ghaib, in the unseen world, in the Malakuti world, that really puts us at a, uh, puts us in a, in, a, in, a, in an advantageous position in terms of our uh, journey towards Allah. And then the Prophet he continues. He says, The Prophet says, I, I came across two other angels in this heaven. So we're, we're still speaking about the heaven that is in closest proximity uh, to the earthly world, the material world. These two angels, they say, Allahumma a'ti kulla munfiqin khalafa. Oh Allah, give and give and provide to all of those who are generous. Allahumma a'ti kulla mumsikin talafa. And, and spoil the work of all of those who are stingy. You know, this speaks to the, the importance of the quality of generosity, where you have specific angels who supplicate, who ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase and to give tawfiq to those who are generous. Generosity is such an important quality that we even have a hadith that tell us that in the story of Musa, when Musa was receiving revelation and he was absent for a period of 40 days, when he returned, he found that his people were worshiping a golden calf. And this fitna was caused by Samiri, a person from among the Israelites. And in the Mosaic law, such a person is to be killed for, for not only uh, creating, a, manufacturing an idol, but also causing other peoples to deviate. But in the case of Samiri, Allah Jibra'il reveals to Musa or Allah reveals to Musa that do not kill a Samiri, spare him. Yes, what he did, he committed a heinous crime, but do not give him that punishment. Why? Spare him that punishment. فَإِنَّهُ سَخِي Because he's a generous person. Even in the life of the Prophet, we see that Rasulullah honored the daughter, the son and the daughter of uh, Hatim al-Ta'i. Hatim al-Ta'i was a very generous Arab in the pre-Islamic era. The Prophet honored his progeny because of the generosity of their, of their father. So generosity is an important quality and we see that in the story of the Mi'raj, uh, there are angel, specific angels who pray for those who have that generous spirit. ثُمَّ مَضَيْتُ فَإِذَا أَنَا بِأَقْوَامٍ لَهُ مَشَافِرٌ كَمَشَافِرِ الْإِبِلِ يَقْرُضُ اللَّحْمَ مِنْ جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَلْقَى فِي أَفْوَاهِهِمْ This is one of the frightening scenes of the Mi'raj where the Prophet وآله, says that we continued on our journey until we approached a group of people whose lips were like the lips of a camel, meaning that they were large. And those lips were being cut. And the meat that had been cut was then forced into their mouths. I mean, you, you can imagine such a horrific and gruesome scene. فَقُلْتُ مَنْ هَؤُلَاءِ يَا جِبْرَائِيلِ So I asked the Prophet, Who are these people, O Jibra'il? فَقَالَ هَؤُلَاءِ الْهَمَّازُونَ الْلَمَّازُونَ These are the, the backbiters. These are the slanderers. And again, 
this also highlights how dangerous this sin is. We have many ahadith, brothers and sisters, that warn us about backbiting, about slandering, about being people who are constantly pursuing the faults of others. There are some people, instead of looking inward and trying to rectify themselves, what they do is they put, you know, they, they put on the binoculars and they want to examine and pursue the faults of others. There's a hadith that I'll share that's, uh, that's not mentioned in the, the story of the Mi'raj, but since we're speaking about the sin of backbiting and slandering and pursuing the faults of others, I think it's noteworthy to mention this hadith, which is attributed to the Prophet ﷺ and the books of both uh, uh, Sunnis and Shias, where the Prophet says, لا تتبعوا عورات المؤمنين Do not pursue or search for the faults of believers. فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ تَتَبَّعَ عَوْرَاتَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ تَتَبَّعَ اللَّهُ عَوْرَتَهُ If you make it a habit of you know, snooping around and trying to find out the flaws of people, if you, if you have this habit of trying to dig up dirt on people, the Prophet says, Allah will pursue your faults. وَمَنْ تَتَبَّعَ اللَّهُ عَوْرَتَهُ فَضَحَهُ وَلَوْ فِي جَوْفِ بَيْتِهِ If Allah pursues your faults, the Prophet says, then know that He will expose you and humiliate you even if someone is hidden in their home. Meaning that if you make it a habit of pursuing the shortcomings of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will one day uh, subject you to uh, the humiliation of being exposed yourself. So again, the Prophet is, is being shown the inner reality of these uh, egregious acts. And we take these things so lightly, but we're, we're totally oblivious and heedless of the, the malakuti uh, dimension of these actions. You know, and, and it's, subhanAllah, it's very similar, you know, when you study pathology, for example, there are certain, th so there are certain diseases where a person looks fine. You can't even tell that they're sick, but inside of their body, they're actually dying. So just because something looks okay outwardly, it doesn't mean that it's not disintegrating inwardly. So similarly, sins may appear to be normal and even uh, pleasurable. However, we know, we understand that, that anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deems to be unlawful is in fact uh, a form of self-harm. Then the Prophet says, ثُمَّ مَضَيْتُ فَإِذَا أَنَا بِأَقْوَامٍ the Prophet says, We continued until I saw a group of people in which fire was being poured into their mouths. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And the fire was also coming out of their back ends. Who are these people, O Jibra'il? Jibra'il says, These are the ones who confiscated and who took the property of the orphans. These are the ones who steal from orphans. And it's, you know, this happens unfortunately. You know, sometimes, you know, we may, we may send money to, uh, to sponsor orphans and God forbid there's someone in the middle of this, this chain uh, who pockets the money. There are people like that who, who steal uh, the, the property of, of orphans. And the Qur'an, even, and this, is, uh, this uh, verse is an allusion to the Qur'an where Allah specifically says that those 
who take, who unlawfully seize the property of orphans, indeed they are consuming uh, fire, and uh, but they don't realize it, right? Because they haven't they haven't transferred over to the hereafter where the secrets and the inner dimensions of our actions become manifest. Qala, the Prophet says, he says, he continues saying, Qala, mararna bimala'ikatin min mala'ikatillah khalaqahum allahu kayfa sha wa wada'ahum wujuhahum kayfa ya wa wada'a wujuhahum kayfa sha The Prophet says, we continued until we came across some angels. Allah created them in a very special way, in a way that He wished to create them. And He created their faces in a way that He wished. لَيْسَ شَيْءٌ مِنْ أَطْبَاقِ أَجْسَادِهِمْ إِلَّا وَهُوَ يُسَبِّحُ اللَّهَ وَيَحْمَدَهُ مِنْ كُلِّ نَاحِيَةٍ بِأَصْوَاتٍ مُخْتَلِفَةٍ The Prophet says that Allah created these angels in a special way. Every part of their bodies was praising Allah. And every part of their body, every part of their, their structure was praising and glorifying Allah bi aswatin mukhtalifa with different voices, with different sounds. So there were different, a, a wide array, a diverse diverse sounds emanating from these angels, all glorifying and praising Allah. أَصْوَاتُهُمْ مُرْتَفِعًا Their voices were loud. بالتحميد They were loud in the praise of God. وَالْبُكَاءَ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ And they were also weeping out of fear and out of awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we notice is that the, the heavens are heavily populated with, uh, with angels. And we actually have uh, a narration from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam where he says that the most abundant creation that Allah brought into being uh, are in fact the angels. There is nothing that populates the, the kingdom, the world of creation more than malaika. So the Prophet says, continuing, فَسَأَلْتُ جِبْرَائِيلَ عَنْهُمْ The Prophet asked about those angels. فَقَالَ كَمَا تَرَى خُلِقُوا Ya Rasulullah, they were created in the way that you see them. إِنَّ الْمَلَكَ مِنْهُمْ إِلَىٰ جَنْبِ صَاحِبِهِ مَا كَلَّمَهُ قَطْ Jibrail says to the Prophet that these angels, you see them, standing side by side, but they have never looked at the angel beside them. And they have never spoken to each other. Can you imagine? You are, they're all standing in close proximity to each other, but not a single angel has ever spoken to the angel that is beside him. And these angels have never looked up. وَلَا خَفَضُوهَا And they've never looked down. إِلَى مَا تَحْتَهَا خَوْفًا مِنَ اللَّهِ Because of their humility before God, their eyes are fixed. They do not move to the, to the right, to the left. They don't raise their heads or lower their heads. فَسَلَّمْتُ عَلَيْهِمْ The Prophet says, I greeted them. I said salam to them. فَرَدُّوا عَلَيَّ إِيمَاءً بِرُؤُوسِهِمْ لَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَيَّ مِنَ الْخُشُوعِ I said salam to them and they signaled with their heads, meaning they didn't respond verbally. They just signaled. and But they did not respond verbally and nor did they even turn and look at me. فَقَالَ لَهُمْ جُبْرَائِيلِ Jibra'il then says to them, هذا محمد النبي الرحمة. He says to the these angels that this is Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله, the Prophet 
of mercy, the Prophet of Rahmah. أرسله الله إلى العباد رسولا ونبيا. Allah sent him to his servants as a messenger and as a prophet. وهو خاتم النبوة. And he is the seal of prophethood. وسيدهم. And he is the leader and the master of all prophets. أفلا تكلمون. Do you not want to speak to him? Don't you want the privilege of communicating with him? قال, the Prophet says, فَلَمَّا سَمِعُوا ذَلِكَ مِنْ جِبْرَائِيلِ When Jibra'il told them, informed them of who I am, أَقْبَلُوا عَلَيَّ بِالسَّلَامِ They moved. It's the first time since they were created that they advanced towards the Prophet and they greeted him. It's the first time since they were created. وَأَكْرَمُونِي And they honored him وَبَشَّرُونِي بِالْخَيْرِ لِي وَلِأُمَّتِي and they gave me glad tidings and glad tidings to my, to my ummah. قَالَ ثُمَّ صَعَدْنَا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ الثَّانِيَةِ So this was all in the first heaven. The Prophet then ascends to the second, to the second heaven. فَإِذَا فِيهَا رَجُلَانِ مُتَشَابِهَانِ The Prophet says, I... As when we entered the second heaven, the second sky, the second realm, I saw two men, two people who resembled each other. Rajulani mutashabihan. They resembled each other. Fakultu manhadani ya Jibrail. So I asked Jibrail, who are these two people? Fakalali ibn al Khala. These two are cousins. They are Yahya ibn Zakaria and Isa ibn Maryam, these two noble prophets. فَسَلَّمْتُ عَلَيْهِمَا I greeted them. وَسَلَّمَا عَلَيْهِ And they greeted me. وَاسْتَغْفَرْتُ لَهُمَا وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لِي I asked Allah to forgive them and they also asked Allah to forgive me. You know, one of the most beautiful aspects of the the traditions about the mi'raj is the prophet's private encounters with the past prophets and you can see how coming in contact and speaking to the ancient prophets served as an important morale booster to the prophet it's a reminder to him that what you are doing is not new the challenges and the hardships that you are enduring are not new. They've happened to all of these prophets. You are continuing this legacy that began with, that began with Adam salam. So there's a sort of a reminder of this, this unity among the prophets. That yes, we were dispatched to humanity at different times, but we are united in our objective. Our objective is to guide people towards the truth. So the Prophet greets them, they greet him, he prays for them and they pray for him. And they say to the Prophet وَقَالَ مَرْحَبًا بِالْأَخِ الصَّالِحِ Welcome, O righteous brother. So you see that there is, there is this, of course this is not a biological brotherhood, but rather it is a, a brotherhood of faith. In fact, even more than that. This is the, the brotherhood of prophethood. Marhaban bil salih salih. Welcome to the righteous brother, to the righteous prophet. وَإِذَا فِيهَا مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَعَلَيْهِمُ الْخُشُوعِ قَدْ وَضَعَ اللَّهُ وَجُوهَهُمْ كَيْفَ شَاءَ لَيْسَ مِنْهُمْ مَلَكٌ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ اللَّهَ وَيَحْمَدَهُ بِأَصْوَاتٍ مُخْتَلِفَةٍ The Prophet also comments here that the angels that I saw in the second heaven were similar to the angels that I saw in the first heaven in terms of their fear of God, how immersed they were in their worship, how they would not pay attention to what was going on around them. They were fully engrossed in their glorification 
and praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ثُمَّ صَعَدْنَا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ الثَّالِثَ Now, and one point that I want to bring to your attention here, brothers and sisters, is we shouldn't conclude here that the place that a prophet occupies in these heavens, these barzakh heavens, it's not necessarily an indication of rank. Because, you know, we will see certain prophets who, are, who occupy higher heavens, but are not necessarily superior to the ones that occupy uh, a lower heaven. You know, point in ca- a case in point is Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam is one of the prophets of Ulul Az. And we will see that there are prophets who are not among the, the messengers of great resolve who are occupying a, uh, a higher heaven. And one of the explanations could be that the higher you are in rank, the more mobility you are given to travel and to journey through the various heavens. So it could be, it doesn't mean that the second heaven is, is, is Isa's permanent residence. It could be that he, you know, he, he occupies and he can travel or, uh, or journey to other uh, parts of that Barzakhi realm. So that's an important uh, note to make because I'm sure you're thinking that is this, is the positioning of prophets in these, in the different heavens, uh, a sign and an indication of rank? And the answer is that that's not necessarily uh, the case. So the Prophet continues saying, ثُمَّ صَعَدْنَا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ الثَّالِثَ We then ascended to the third heaven. فَإِذَا فِيهَا رَجُلٌ فُضِّلَ حُسْنُهُ عَلَى سَائِرِ الْخَلْقِ We came across a man, a person, who was given more beauty than all of the other creation, all other people. He had striking physical attractiveness, striking beauty. And if you compare him, his beauty, to the beauty of others, it is like comparing a full moon to the stars in terms of beauty. A full moon is bright and the stars are like little specks of brightness. So this is an indication of how attractive and how stunning the beauty of this individual is. So the Prophet says, Man hadha ya Jibrail? Who is this person who has been given this beauty? فَقَالَ هَذَا أَخُوكَ Yusuf. This is your brother Yusuf, the great Prophet of Allah. فَسَلَّمْتُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَيْهِ We exchanged greetings. وَاسْتَغْفَرْتُ لَهُ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لِي he sought maghfirah for me, I sought maghfirah for him. And he said, Marhaban bin Nabi Salih wal Salih. Welcome, O righteous Prophet, O righteous brother, Wal Mab'uth Fizaman Salih, and the one who was sent at the best of times, the most appropriate of times. Wa Ida fiha mala ikatun alayhim min al khushu mithlama. The Prophet also mentions that there were angels in the third heaven that were similar to the who were similar to the angels who occupied the first and the second heaven, meaning that they were they were in a state of humility, they were humble, they were engaged in worship, they were immersed in the glorification of Allah. وَقَالَ لَهُمْ جُبْرَائِيلَ فِي أَمْنِ And Jibra'il said to them the same thing that he said in the, the lower heavens, essentially that this is Muhammad, the messenger of mercy. He has been sent to Allah as a prophet, as a messenger. He is the seal of prophets. So Jibra'il would notify the angels in, e- in, every, in each of these heavens, in each of these realms, and they would meet the prophet, they would greet him, and uh, they would make dua for him. ثُمَّ صَعَدْنَا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ الرَّابِعَةِ We then ascended to the fourth heaven. 
فقلت من هذا يا جبرائيل We ascended to the fourth heaven and I saw a man وإذا فيها رجل And I said to Jibreel, who is this? قال هذا إدريس رفعه الله مكانا عليا This is Idris who has been raised to a lofty station. فسلمت عليه I greeted him. وسلم وسلم عليه And he greeted me. واستغفرت له واستغفر لي We both asked Allah to forgive each other. وإذا فيها من الملائكة وإذا فيها من الملائكة الخشوع مثل ما في السماوات التي عبرناها فبشروني بالخير لي ولأمتي The Prophet also notes here that we also saw angels uh, who were similar to the angels of the, the lower heavens. And again, this is a, the point that I wanted to make here. So you hear, we see that uh, Idris occupies the fourth heaven and Isa occupies the lower heaven. But this doesn't mean that Idris is superior or higher in rank uh, to Isa alayhi salam. ثُمَّ صَعَدْنَا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ الْخَامِسَةِ we then ascended to the, the fifth heaven. فَإِذَا فِيهَا رَجُلٌ كَهْلٌ عَظِيمُ الْعَيْنِ We saw a tall man who had very prominent eyes, large eyes. حَوْلَهُ ثُلَّةٌ مِنْ أُمَّتِهِ فَأَعْجَبَتْنِي كَثْرَتُهُمْ He had a lot of people around him. A lot of people from his ummah around him. And the Prophet was impressed by their numbers. فَقُلْتُ مَنْ هَذَا يَا جبرائيل? Who are these people, O Jibra'il? فَقَالَ هَذَا الْمُجِيبُ فِي قَوْمِهِ هَارُونِ إِبْنِ عمران. This is Harun, the brother of Musa. And it seems that those who are with him were the ones who followed, who obeyed Harun in the absence of Musa. So these are those who remained loyal to the... This, of course, Harun died before Musa, but at least when he was, he was appointed as the representative of Musa in his absence, it seems that those who were loyal and obedient to him uh, are, were, uh, and who died are, are with Harun in that station. So the Prophet asks, who is this? This is Harun, the son of Imran. And he was, you know, one of the things that's mentioned here is, هذا المجيب في قوم. He was very well liked. He was very well liked by his people, even more so uh, than Musa. You know, it seems that, you know, he's also known as Al-Hayyinu al that he had a very gentle uh, demeanor that made him very, very uh, uh, approachable and uh, attractive to people. The Prophet says that we exchanged greetings, وَاسْتَغْفَرْتُ لَهُ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لِي And then the Prophet mentions that there were also angels in that, in that heaven that were similar to the angels in the lower heavens. And then in the sixth heaven, and I'll just you know quickly go through the narration. In the sixth heaven, Rasulullah says that we encountered a very tall man uh, whose whose body was covered with hair; it was coming out of his uh, shirt, of his garments. And the man said that Bani Israel consider me to be the best. So he says, يَزْعُمُ بَنُوا إِسْرَائِيلِ أَنِّي أَكْرَمُ وُلْدِ آدَمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَهَذَا رَجُلٌ أَكْرَمُ أَكْرَمَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مِنِّي So before he's even introduced to the Prophet, he says, you know, Bani Israel consider me to be the best among the children of Adam. However, this man, he points to the Prophet, he says, this one is much better than me in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, Jibra'il informs the Prophet that this is Musa alayhi salam. And just from this interaction, you see 
the, the incredible humility of Musa alayhi salam. You notice that none of the other prophets explicitly uh, introduce themselves as uh, being inferior to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, but this is, you know, this is what makes Musa kalimullah, this is what makes him Musa. Uh, we even have a hadith that he was chosen because of his unique humbleness and humility. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says that we greeted each other, we prayed for each other's forgiveness, and the angels in that realm were, all, were also busy and they were engrossed in prayer and worship and supplication, just as they were in the, the lower heavens. We then ascended to the seventh heaven. Now we're, we're reaching the, the outer limits of the heavens. فَمَا مَرَرْتُ بِمَلَكٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَ إِلَّا قَالُوا يَا مُحَمَّدِ احْتَجِمْ وَأْمُرْ أُمَّتَكَ بِالْحِجَامَةِ While when we reached the seventh heaven, any angel that I came in contact with was telling me to do hijama, which is cupping. For those of you who are not familiar with cupping, it's basically where it's it's recommended in the Islamic tradition. It seems to have great health benefits to do cupping, where it's about it's a suction cup that's applied, and the the bad blood, as they call it, the blood, uh, the coagulated blood, I believe they call it, collects, and they create small little uh, incisions, and they extract. Uh, that blood it's typically done from from the back i did it when i was uh when i was in iran uh in 2016 and uh if it's done uh properly it has it has great health benefits so here the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, is encouraged to do hijama and the prophet used to do it and uh, and command your ummah to do it as well now of course this is not uh, an obligation, but it is one of the uh, the recommended acts uh, in the Islamic tradition. Now, why is the Prophet being told to do to do hijama at this juncture of the journey? That's truly one of the the mysteries of the the hadith of uh, of the Mi'raj. Allah knows best. The hadith continues saying, "What idha fiha when they reach the seventh heaven." وَإِذَا فِيهَا رَجُلٌ أَشْمَطُ الرَّأْسِ وَاللِّحْيَةِ We reached a man who, who had a mix of black and white on his hair and his beard. It's a, a mixture of white hair and black hair. جَالِسٌ عَلَىٰ كُرْسِ He was sitting on a chair. فَقُلْتُ يَا جُبْرَائِيلِ مَنْ هَذَا الَّذِي فِي السَّمَاءِ السَّابِعَةِ عَلَىٰ بَابِ الْبَيْتِ الْمَعْمُورِ فِي جِوَارِ اللَّهِ Who is this person? who is sitting at the gate of Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur. Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur is essentially the Qibla, the direction of the prayer. It's like the Kaaba of the inhabitants of the skies. All of those who worship in the, in the realms beyond Alam dunya their, their Qibla is Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur. And Ibrahim is there. He is... And the Prophet says, "Fi Allah, that he's occupying this position of uh, extreme nearness to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. فَقَالَ هَذَا يَا مُحَمَّدٌ أَبُوكَ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ This is your father. Your for, this is your forefather Ibrahim. Now it seems from the Quran and from the Ahadith that after Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. The greatest among all after Ahlul Bayt is Ibrahim. So after Rasulullah and the Aimma, it seems that Ibrahim is the greatest of all of the prophets and the messengers, based on traditions like this and based on other traditions uh, that maybe we can uh, touch upon later. فَقَالَ هَذَا يَا مُحَمَّدْ أَبُوكِ إِبْرَاهِيمُ 
وهذا محلك ومح ومحل من اتقى من أمتك. This is Ibrahim and this is your place, meaning that after you die, this is your Barzakhi residence, this is your station. And this is the station of those who have taqwa after you. And this could be a reference to the, the imma alayhim salam ثم قرأ رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله. When the Prophet saw Ibrahim, he saw the station of Ibrahim, he recited Surah Ali Imran, verse 68, إِنَّ أَوْلَى النَّاسِ بِإِبْرَاهِيمَ لَلَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ وَهَذَا النَّبِيُّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاللَّهُ وَلِيُّ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Indeed, the most worthy of Ibrahim, the, clo- the one who has the greatest claim to Ibrahim, because, you know, the Jews claim to be following the tradition of Ibrahim, the Christians claim to be uh, the followers of Ibrahim. You know, after all, these are Abrahamic faiths, so they all make a claim to be the closest in proximity to Ibrahim, to be the most, uh, the most devout in terms of adherence to the Abrahamic way, but here the Qur'an says, the one who has the greatest claim to Ibrahim are those who follow him. And this Prophet, because Rasulullah is following, is truly following the Abrahamic way. And those who, who believe in the message of Rasulullah, and Allah is the, the guardian of the believers. فَسَلَّمْتُ alay. The Prophet greets Ibrahim, وَسَلَّمَ alay. وَقَالَ مَرْحَبًا بِالنَّبِيِّ الصَّالِحِ Welcome, O righteous Prophet, وَالْإِبْنِ الصَّالِحِ And righteous son, righteous son. You know, Ibrahim, he made a dua when he built Kaaba, And the Prophet ﷺ was the answer to that dua that Ibrahim made at the Kaaba when he was raising the foundations of the Kaaba, And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he used to say, Ana da'watu Ibrahim. Ana da'watu jaddi Ibrahim. I am the fulfillment of the prayer of my grandfather Ibrahim. Wal mab'ud fa zaman al salih. Ibrahim says, You are the one who has been sent uh, at the, the righteous time, the, the, the best of times. Wa idha fiha min al mala'ika al khushu' mithlu ma fi al samawat. The Prophet says there were angels in that heaven who were similar to the angels of the lower uh, heavens. فَبَشَّرُونِي بِالْخَيْرِ لِي وَلِأُمَّتِي And they gave me the glad tidings and they gave glad tidings to my ummah. Inshallah, in our next episode, we will we will continue our conversation on the, uh, the Mi'raj and inshallah we'll conclude it with some of the final and the most important experiences uh, the, of the Prophet uh, in his ascension and uh, we'll delve into that and then we will return inshallah to the activities and the events that are taking place on earth and uh, we'll move on uh, chronologically with uh, the biography of the Prophet. Thank you so much brothers and sisters for tuning in and I look forward to having you join me on uh, our upcoming episodes of the life of of Prophet Muhammad wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahirin. Uh, Zain, I barely can hear you. I don't know if you can raise the volume. I can hear you a little bit better. It's still a bit, uh, it's still a bit hard to hear. Can you say that again? Yeah, it's better now. So this is the, that's a very good question. We know that the Prophet ﷺ, in his own life, at minimum he would do istighfar 
70 times a day without committing a single legal sin. Now, the problem with us is we, we typically associate istighfar with sin. You know, why do I seek forgiveness? Because I committed a sin. Whereas in the Islamic tradition, there is emphasis on istighfar whether we commit a sin or not. Because yes, even if someone does not commit a sin in a legal sense, we, because of our inability to worship Allah in the way that He deserves to be worshipped, because of our inability to thank Him and show gratitude to Him for the blessings that are uncountable, prophets constantly feel this sense of inadequacy in their relationship with Allah. So because no one, because no one can reciprocate gratitude in a way that does justice to the, the divine blessings that are given, prophets always feel that they fall short in their worship. And, and, and therefore, because of that, they feel that it is appropriate and it is necessary for them to do, uh, to remember, to ask Allah for forgiveness. Because of, because of their inability to thank Him the way that He deserves to be thanked. So this is, so when prophets ask each other, ask to forgive each other, it, it's, it's from that aspect, not because that they committed a sin. Other prophets may have uh, committed what is known as tarkul awla, where they may have done something that wasn't haram, but there was something else that was better that they could have done. You know, like with the story of Yunus alayhi salam. Yunus, he, he lost patience with his people. He was preaching to them. His words were falling on deaf ears. And he left. He abandoned his people to go preach to another community. Did he commit a, a, a sin? Did Allah tell him that you are not allowed to leave these people? No. But it was expected of Yunus to be a bit more patient with his people. So he became frustrated and he left. He abandoned his people too early. And this is where we see the, the story of him being consumed by a whale. This is an example of Tarkul Awla, where you didn't, it's not that he did anything bad. He went to go preach to some other people that perhaps would have been more receptive. But Allah has higher expectations of his Anbiya. So sometimes istighfar could be asking for forgiveness for doing something that was below the high divine standard that was set for prophets or simply because of our inability to express gratitude to Allah in a way that is befitting. Because, because we can't enumerate His blessings, it's impossible for us to do justice to Allah, to thank Him in a way that's befitting. And because of that inability, prophets see themselves as needing to constantly ask for forgiveness. Does that make sense? Allah, I mean, I don't know, I, I can't comment with certainty, but it seems that the the higher the higher heavens are places of higher purity, meaning that the high and, and we when we say higher, it's important to remember that we're not speaking about spatial highness, physical highness, because we're these are realms that are that are not bound by time and space in the way that the earthly world is. But as you ascend to higher worlds, you you are in closer proximity to Allah. So it all, only makes sense that those who are being chastised are remo further removed from those, those higher realms. So you're not going to see someone in the seventh heaven being punished for ghibah because they, they're not even, existentially they cannot even access uh, those uh, those levels and those realms, and again, Allah knows this. But that's just my uh, analysis of that. <laughs>